That's the good part. Um, so who are we? I am here tonight with Eric Bailey, who is going to introduce himself because he is much better at introducing himself than I am. Uh, I am also Eric, but Eric Roos. I am Dutch. Eric Bailey lives in Boston, so there's a bit of a time difference. And uh, what do I do? I work at ING, a big Dutch bank. It's where I work on a web component team, where I work on the accessibility of the components. I also work as an accessibility consultant. And every now and then, for example, here on Twitch, I like to talk about accessibility. And I like to host other people and invite them and talk about what they do. And tonight, or at least tonight for me, afternoon for you in a few minutes, um, we have Eric Bailey. Eric, why don't you tell me, uh, who are you? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm Eric with a C, not Eric with a K. <laughs> Big difference. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like you said, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States, and uh, I am a graphic designer, designer, UX designer, whatever the title du jour is for uh, ThoughtBot, which is a digital consultancy firm for uh, products such as websites, web apps, app apps, databases, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit of a strange situation. I mean, we're, we're still quarantined. I think you're quarantined as well. Yeah. The U.S. is not doing a good job at it, but uh, I am lucky that... You know, my my state and my city and uh, my organization are all on board. Um, you know, it's it's strange times. So yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, strange is a word we see a, a lot these days. Um, and then there are some uh, protests as well in your city, I believe. Yeah, uh, there are protests across the world, um, my city included, um, and you know. Yeah, just to kind of talk about that, like uh, the United States is racist. Um, it, it, we are the modern inventors of white versus black classification. Uh, I've been doing a crash course in race and I know that it is a very complicated issue, um, but it, it's a very important one to kind of internalize and understand and um it may not always be something that makes you feel good especially no if you're no force it force to confront some preconceived notions and uh you know in particular if you're okay with it what i'd like to do today um is kind of as we have a conversation about this article kind of talk about how that intersects with uh the black disability space yeah sure yeah, yeah i mean um i i I live in my own Twitter bubble, of course, as we all do, and I have so I have seen so many things about being inclusive, and I cannot separate what's happening in the US now and and the protests uh, from accessibility. It's really tough. It's like if you want to be inclusive and want to include everybody and and give everybody an equal chance. I mean, what's the difference? It it applies to both fields, I think. So yeah, sure. I think it's a yeah. really interesting subject. Yeah, and I'd also like to throw out that I am by no way an expert in either accessibility or race relations or uh, black, specifically no. the black dis disability community. And more to the point, it's a space that I've only newly become more keyed into, uh, mostly via Twitter and some very good writing by some uh, authors in the black disabled space. And, you know, it's one of those things where I feel fortunate for the privilege to be able to learn from their experiences and um you know it's one of those things where they're choosing to spend their own effort to put that information out there and that's it is one of the things i do actually really love about the accessibility space is you know people sharing their experiences so everybody can benefit and yeah better things well let's let's hope we can do that tonight as well then yeah, yeah. um yeah I, I guess we could just start with the article then right we'll, we'll just circle back to this whenever you like um, because let's let's start before writing the article. It's a, it's an article for Smashing Magazine. Um, how did that go? Like like what happened before you started writing this? <laughs> yeah, big yeah. question. Um, 
So I will say that Smashing Magazine, as well as CSS Tricks, are two places I like to write for. Um, and I'm fortunate that they like me writing for them, I hope. <laughs> I think. Oh, you, um, you, you ha they gave you the space for at least two articles, so you yeah, must be doing yeah. something, right? Um, but I would like to say that uh, it's one of those things where if you have something that you are interested in, um, and it's in in the technology front end space, um, you should write that article and pitch them if that's something you're interested in. It can be really intimidating because of their names and like their perception within the industry, but um, they're very friendly and they're very accommodating. And uh, if it's something you're interested in, just like take the shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I had started this piece uh, in, um, believe October of last year and uh, I originally wanted it to be a piece about the nuance between how something is technically accessible versus actually usable Oh, and unfortunately the piece didn't really turn out that way um, it turned into sort of more of a here's how to fix common problems but Part of that, I think, is we're still doing such a bad job at the basics that usability, you know, we're just, we're not to that space yet. We, we can't talk about it intelligently. And it's one of those, like, I want intuitive, elegant, usable experiences for everyone, regardless of their ability or circumstance. But, like we still got to learn to walk before we learn to run. And that really sucks. Yeah. Well, talking personally, I mean, I'm in quarantine. I try to do a lot on the net, you know, try to order my stuff and arrange stuff on websites. And I do have the feeling that I get angry slightly faster. Now I'm recovering from brain surgery. It, 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 I have the feeling I might be a bit more angry, but also, way there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also I'm, I'm like uh, more proactive. Let's call it that way. I react faster. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing that the volume might be very low, so I'm just gonna check with my big bunch of software. Oh, no, I don't pay for this piece of software. Thank you for the pop-up. The volume should be about twice as loud now, so this was just a, a chat question in between. Um, but if I look at, uh, yeah, what I'm doing myself, I order a lot of stuff online. And there are so many bad experiences. Like, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, I, I don't want to call out any web shops or anything. And that's not necessary because they're pretty much all bad. So that makes it easy. Um, but for example, I, I had a feedback form for my hospital. So they wanted feedback on their website. And they used a CAPTCHA. Like, they needed image recognition. And they have unlabeled form fields. And there, there are so many usability issues that I... It's too much, you know, it's too much. Yeah. It's just aggravating. Things don't work. I've, I've had to deal with so many Twitter uh, customer services that all do the same thing. That's also really annoying. But these, these people like experiences and uh, they all just don't work. So uh, it's, it's like I'm learning myself new lessons every day. Yeah, I mean, it's also, I always struggle with when do you be the angry accessibility person versus when do you try to lead by example? Um, you know, like you get more flies with honey than vinegar. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, for sure. But like the problem with like the hospital system is, you know, this, th this service that they're providing is institutionalized and it's created by a developer or a team of developers. I, I get and the question, if you could raise your volume a little bit, is that possible? Uh, let's see. Is this any better? I'll lean forward into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Hug the mic. Yeah. I think it's uh, slightly better. Okay, yeah. Remember how I was saying I need to get a headset after? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Send us your wish list. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Um, but yeah, hospitals. It's one of those things where potentially even six people create a system that affects 
millions of people and um it's one of those things where it's like i get mad because they don't have that exp accessibility experience and they get paid very good money to do it but at the same time i also understand that there's a lot of outside pressure on them to deliver functionality and so it's like it is why i i'm glad things like lawsuits exist to compel people because it stinks to have to get to that point but we just keep proving over and over and over again that we need to yeah if the carrot doesn't work you're gonna need the stick yeah yeah, I'm, I'm not in a, a culture where suing companies or organizations is such a big thing, but I can understand that it's a, a way to, to get to a certain goal. And uh, we at least we have some rules on the way, some, some rules that they have to stick to. And some organizations are really sensitive to rules. So I hope that's going to make a difference. But um, yeah, like you say, it's, it's like they're missing the experience, which is really strange, especially when you're in healthcare. You really hope those people have at least some experience. Um, and what al also bugs me, like we're, we're nice and complaining right now, is that you see so many companies saying, yeah, we can build an accessible website. And they will say it when they don't have the experience. And that's that's something that, that well, that, that makes me think, like how can we reach these people? How can we improve the quality of these products? Yeah. And it's I, also like, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, there's like, also the performative nature of both accessibility and ad advocacy as well i think and like especially with every company falling over itself for uh black lives matter you know in the last week yeah i think there's a lot of parallels with um previously when it was in vogue to talk about how inclusive and empathetic you are and it's one of those things where it's like yes but what are you doing specifically about it how are you quantifying it you know what what have you done before this happened and what will you continue to do and where were you failing and like those are tough tough yeah. uncomfortable questions but like the parallels are very similar and i think it's really hard for an organization to find a company that does it right if you don't know what is right or wrong yep. i mean if if you buy a website i i guess we can call it that way but you don't know what makes a website accessible or not, then how do you pick one organization over the other to, to build it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, like you only know a VPAT exists if you know a VPAT exists. So yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we don't even have VPATs here in the US. Or you have it in the US, but we don't have it in the EU. So uh, there's, there's no quality mark or anything. You can just say, hey, I build accessible websites. And if you're, uh, if you're skilled enough at selling it, then good luck with that. I will say the EU from the outside is just far more progressive about this sort of thing as well. Like, uh, you know, you have the equivalent of Section 508 baked into the charter, and it's and it doesn't apply to anybody yet. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's 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 a strange experience because uh, my experience here in the in the EU is that uh, I often look at the US and say, "Hey, you are very progressive." Uh, because when you look at conferences and not the online type that we all have now, uh, you have like season and, and you can go to Toronto or you can go to Austin. Like there are so many great experiences and there's so much knowledge being shared within uh, the US that doesn't seem to be there in the EU. And that's also very strange. So I'm glad I, I can be online right now. And we're like bridging an ocean. Um, we should do that more often. I hope yeah. I can get a lot of people from different places and share more experiences because there's a big yeah. difference. Yeah, I mean, the remote thing is, is really interesting in that, you know, I'm gonna tie it back to accessibility. Yeah. Um, you know, like, let's talk about structural ableism in the workforce where basically overnight, it turns out we can all work from home. We, can yeah. all, we all can work a 40 hour work week asynchronously um, and then like, you know, again, how much of it is, is performative, which is like, oh yeah, look how good we are at digital transformation. Yeah. Like, only when you've been compelled by this external force. And, like, we'll, we'll do it when we have to, right? Yeah. And uh, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm sure you've seen the tweets and the blog posts as well, but like 
basically everybody I know in the disability space is like, oh, hmm, interesting how this happened. Yeah. When we all asked for it, it was not possible. Yeah. And now within a week, everybody is saying, like, you cannot even come to the office. Even if you want to, you're not welcome here. It's just like yeah. the opposite. Yeah, because for the people that are not very familiar with all the things that we see on Twitter, I think there's some strong overlap there. Um, a lot of people with disabilities have a preference for working at home. They enjoy working at home. They have their reasons to work from home. Um, and they, they might have spent their time working at a company and saying, hey, can I work from home? Uh, maybe they applied to a job and said, yes, I can do this job, but only from home. There are, are many situations that working from home is preferred. And it always seemed impossible. It seemed like an impossible question. I think it's no longer an impossible question. I think it's the basic default for everybody now, and it's it's just a strange way to look at things. But um, yeah, if you have to, you can do a lot of things, apparently. Yeah, it's also like there's some subtlety in there too, where like working eight hours in a row is not necessarily required anymore. Um, nope. You know, do you need to have a face-to-face -face conversation? No. Good luck. You know, like, yeah. It's uh, and then like kind of also the normalization of life where one thing we're trying to do at work is very much just have a warts and all approach to our meetings where it's if you have to leave to change a diaper, yeah. That's fine. That's, fine. <laughs> that's life. Yeah. Like You've got a dog that is just really excited that you're here. Great. You know, put the camera on them. We don't want to see you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we never cared about your face anyway. That's basically the message that we're getting now. So, yeah, online, offline, it, I'm just going to circle back. It's basically an equivalent experience for a lot of people. Hey. Yeah, there I've got my bridge. Um, yeah, it's really interesting where that's going. But, um, yeah, let's circle back because we can talk about many subjects, I think. But people know... Uh, know this article and not all the other things we could talk about um, because you started this some months back and you were looking um, to look at what's required and what actually helps people and then you got probably an editor or something to look over your shoulder yeah and it was an experience probably oh yeah <laughs> I love working with editors because I think I write well and then I worked with like an editor and I was like ah I know nothing yeah <laughs> So they're very, they're very instructive moments. Um, and uh, Iris, who is the editor at Smashing Magazine, is just especially lovely to work with. Um, yeah, I, I think the other thing that is very much core to this piece is the representation angle, um, in which most of this is just quoting uh, disabled people, self-identified disabled people, yeah, and then recontextualizing what they report and turning it into advice. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to share the URL in the chat right now, and I think a lot of people have read it already. But I'm just going to ask the people that are uh, watching right now for your information. We have eight people watching, um, as far as I know, as far as my statistics are correct. I don't know. Um, but the question is, do you have any questions for Eric, the Eric with the C? Uh, about this article or anything related before we get started. I'm just going to give it a second because there are delays, but not big ones. Well, if any questions pop up, people can just ask them and I'll, I'll interrupt you. So be prepared. Yeah, yeah I, I view this as a conversation between yeah. two Eric's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's the good part. <laughs> um, so you got writing and you got a great editor and you knew then that you know nothing, which is a great experience because then there's much to learn. Yeah. And yeah. you ended up, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Please continue. No, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I think there's a, a, feels like a third wave in the accessibility space right now where we're figuring out that there is a lot of gray area in between what you think works on paper and how it's actually used. And like first wave is like, it, this exists, we need to do something about it. And I think that's like kind of historically when we first have 
like that's the era of like table-based layout and you know being like this is this is terrible you shouldn't do this and then you know the the semantic markup movement happens where it's very academic where it's like well if you write your code this way it will work because it's a standard and standards are how we have normal you know consistent yeah. things that's how standard and, works right yeah and now we're we're finding that like oh if it turns out like people are complicated and if you throw this technology in front of somebody who actually uses it you need to actually ask them what they think about it because there are bugs and quirks and like expectations for behavior and it always doesn't it doesn't always deliver on its promise and uh, i don't know if you've seen the marcy, marcy sutton article on um accessible routing and single page applications that's such a challenge yeah yeah like it's just it's not good enough <laughs> like no no i i've had a shot at it as well or, or like sideways looking what other were, were people uh other people were working on it and i uh, i looked over their shoulder and and i saw so many issues like um i mean in the base it's also an issue you're trying to reinvent the web basically you know, like yeah. routing, that's like one of the basic things that web pages do. Um, so it is a big challenge, but it's also interesting to see that, that whenever you try to reinvent something, you're gonna run into stuff. Yeah. And there's so many things that you run, can, can run into, even when you use the standards, because they never yeah. consider what we're doing these days or what people are there uh, are available on the web to use your website. So yeah, yeah that's a big challenge. Yeah, and I think there's there's a lot of privilege at play there as well, because when, you know, if you really do your homework and you dig into the commits and the conversations for many of the single page app frameworks, um, they're made by overwhelmingly, you know, able white men with very expensive, very powerful computers. And, you know, structurally, we haven't had accessibility as part of like how we teach people to do websites no. and so when they threw out a lot of what the browser gives you for free they didn't understand that it's like it's there for a reason and <laughs> one of those reasons is it's quite literally the mechanism that some you know some people use to operate the web and live life and like that's what keeps me up at night <laughs> yeah i hope it doesn't but yeah i understand yeah. i mean it works on my machine that it just gets a whole new meaning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, and and that's something that we also get back to. I guess we, we're not even starting with the article yet. I'm I'm just gonna read some. Okay, so yeah. you wrote about equivalent experiences. What are they? Uh, an equivalent experience is one that has been deliberately conceived of and built to be able to be used by the widest range of people. To create an equivalent experience, you must understand all the different ways people interact with technology, as well as barriers they experience. Well, I think that compares really well to what you just said about people just taking their own situation as a base. Um, they don't know what all the barriers could be even or what experiences there are. Um, uh, there are some people in the Netherlands that, that try to get these things into education as well. I think that's really a nice angle to go with it. Um, it has been my experience, at least uh, in my work, that you can try to educate people that already uh, do something. And that's really hard because that's that's change, man uh, change management. You know, you, you have to like bend them to your will or something extreme like that. Um, but the fun thing is if you get new people and you say, hey, everything we do is uh, is accessible, they will just take it as a fact. Mm -hmm. And they will start from that point and, and create something that is accessible. Yeah, I, I strongly believe in normalization and denormalization where like the more it's just what you do, it's it's better. <laughs> and like yeah. the more you can remove bad things that are, it's just what you do, like that's also good. Like, you know, I don't know, using buttons for links. <laughs> yeah, all the small things, right? Yeah. I'm going to scroll a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I think I'm going to end up reading this all. Um, if you spend enough time interacting with digital accessibility uh, practitioners, you may encounter the phrase equivalent experience. This saying concisely sums up a lot of the philosophy behind accessibility work. 
our industry tends to be uh, a tense our industry tends to place a lot of focus on how, often at the, uh, at the expense of why. For accessibility-related concerns, it is vital to learn about the history and lived experiences of disabled people as a context for understanding the need for design and code created with access in mind. And, and this is rather interesting because, you know, I, I, le- I work at a big organization and they, they split the roles. Mm-hmm. And you basically have uh, UX designers, you have uh, full stack developers, you have back end developers, maybe if you're lucky, a a few front end developers. But this really touches for me on the use of personas and thinking about users. So my first, um, yeah, I I think I would tend to put these kind of things with the UX designers. Do you think these things that I am reading here do belong to UX designers or are they important to more people? I think every facet of business um but specifically and i say this as a ux designer um a lot of the failures and many of the failures that are not programmatically detectable in accessibility are created in the design phase and passed on to developers and that's not great (laughs) um you know things like color contrast are are easy uh but like you know, I, I think the big, one of the biggest problems, and I talk about it in the article below, is uh, cognitive accessibility considerations, and um, you know, complicated interfaces, abstract metaphors, like weird interactivity patterns that are just not, not what people know how to intuitively operate, and it's really difficult. Trying to um, reinvent the wheel and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a really big problem with designers who design as a method to exercise control as a as opposed to like enable <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that's just ego yeah who, who are you working for yeah yeah if you want to be a painter be a painter get out of design i'm sorry bye yeah i don't see many paintings on the web but i i do get what you mean yeah, yeah. i mean I've, i studied at an art academy so i know where uh, aesthetics uh, play a role mm-hmm. um we're getting some questions on the chat. First, uh, somebody says, inaccessibility by design is hard to fix in code. I think that's a good one-liner for what you're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and what is your thought on the accessibility of the platform itself? And that's for, for both of us. And then somebody says, it feels like compared to other platforms media, uh, the web has a unique set of gotchas and requires a lot more knowledge. Why is that? And what could developers do to improve the platform itself? So, and, and, and other platforms, it's like native apps with baked in accessibility or uh, a book where they'll be mostly accessible with just a few pure mutations, like a large letter format or audiobook or braille. Um, so why isn't the web as accessible as other platforms? I guess that's, that's basically the idea behind it. Uh, have a shot. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, personally, I think the web is a radically accessible platform. It's just what we do to it that makes it inaccessible. Um, and I know like a lot of people like to say, oh, it just, it works out of the box, it's accessible. But like you can, you know, the interoperability it, it creates, you just do not find elsewhere. And that interoperability translates directly into interfacing with assistive technology and technology that can be co-opted to be assistive technology. So like, it's just a lot, it has a lot more potential. Um, And then it's a bottom up as opposed to a top down approach where if you have an app and it is inaccessible, you know, it's a binary, you can't do anything about that. Whereas if you are sufficiently motivated, you can potentially fix a bad website to make it work for you. Um, And I think that's really important to think about because we're just putting more shit on the internet. I don't know if I can swear here, but like, if you can only go online to pay your taxes, you know, you you might get thrown in jail if you don't. And like, um, and then just, I think the track record of apps, especially in on the Android platform, their accessibility is awful. 
like almost to a fault and uh it's just it, it's scary because <laughs> yeah. again it's just it's just this like categorical failure so like i'm team web but i also know the web could do better i'd love to see browsers have more heuristic evaluation and remediation uh the same way they do for a lot of javascript issues the same way they do for a lot of malformed requests um i think just to, it's back they can oh, just sorry. deliver a better experience basically yeah yeah which is you know we've we've already decided that the browser isn't neutral um in terms of how it handles failure states so let's just keep going there and you know, to, to bring it back into structural stuff, like historically browsers have not prioritized accessibility. Um, I'm really happy to see Firefox and Mozilla specifically becoming very active in that space and then kind of goading Chrome to, along to follow yep. suit. Um, browsers are getting a voice actually, like they already deviated from, from being neutral. And now the way they deviate is actually something that brings value. Yeah. And like, that's one of the things that also just like kills me, which is the promise of accessibility is very good from a technical mindset in that you have stability, you have repeatability, you have uh, programmatic access to things, which is great for automation, which is great for like, creating testing frameworks and like integration, you know, integration testing and all that good stuff. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an education problem and it's a mindset problem. Yeah. And on, on one hand, I would say we, we don't like resources. I mean, there is so much that is possible on the web and at other moments I think, well, maybe there's too much that's possible. I mean, if you look at, at the, an Android or an iOS app, um, there's less that you can break, but there's also less that you can do right. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a tighter path that you walk or something. So yeah. yeah, maybe that's also the benefit of it still being really new compared to the web. Uh, and maybe it's the benefit of the books being really old, that the world has adjusted to books and not the other way around. Um, but there, I, I feel there's something in, in the life cycle of things, you know, like the age determines how, how flexible it is and what you can do with it. And maybe in, in like five or 10 years, we all use the same frameworks and we can fix accessibility in one spot. I don't know. But right now there are so many things that we can do, both good and bad, thankfully. But yeah. 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 I think I think we are back to the SPA front. I think we're in the awkward teenage years of a transition to some sort of standard about a routing-based approach. Um, yeah. I, need, I would love to see that because you got to do this you got to do this at the standards level to like compel people to think about routing <laughs> or accessible yeah. routing. Yeah, if, I, I I hope to find the, the spots where you can reach the most people at once, you know? Like if yeah. there's some, I don't know if, if, if choke point is the right word for it, but um, was there not some Greek person that said, give me a long enough lever and I can lift anything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess it's a bit like that. Um, I get another message on the chat. We have 12 people watching right now. Uh, if a Whoa. browser, yeah, it's, it's getting better. It's always, always going up. You know, people see your name and they join afterwards. No, I don't know. Uh, it says if a, if a browser can specify what is wrong, it can attempt to fix it on the user side. Yeah. Uh, which be, would be a great safety net, but shouldn't that, uh, shouldn't then be a reason for devs to keep making broken. So, oh yeah. So, so. The danger is that dev developers never learn, you know? They keep making broken stuff, but because the browser will fix it anyway. Well, we're, we're already doing that. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, we already it, do it the broken stuff. We got that covered. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would love it if it was presented. Um, I think this is a Web We Want initiative, but uh, which is a really cool project where it's like asking web workers specifically what they want on the web to yeah. guide the yeah, it's paving the cow paths. Um, but I'd love to see it presented as a console just, error, you know, like web, web we want.org. This is the one, right? Yeah, I believe so. No, nope. it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. I think it's something with FY, uh, FYI. 
yeah, webv1.fyi. Yeah. I'm just going to share this in the chat for the people that want to have a look at it. Yeah. And and this is a website where people can basically say, hey, this is what I want, right? Mm -hmm. This is where I want the web to go. Yeah. And knowing the web, it will probably take about five years at least for the smallest change, but still people can actually guide it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Make it a console warning or a console error. Like developers already know that you want to get rid of those as much as you possibly can. Um, yeah. It's something we can track, right? You know, it's yep. this little thing that's on or off. Give us a chart or a checklist. People yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which and I, is, uh, if oh, I, I'm... yeah, <laughs> if I understand correctly, uh, Google is also going to look at Lighthouse scores now for their SEO ranking. So if you score good on Lighthouse, you get a good score on Google. And Lighthouse also checks some accessibility stuff, right? I believe last I researched with their update, they're, they're updating their scoring uh, for time to interactive or whatever the new acronym is for their performance. Um, what is it this year? Yeah. I believe accessibility is still not factored into SEO, which is a um. bummer. I've, I've written about this um, because I think Google, they've already taken a hit a few years ago where they decided that non-performing websites get deranked and they lost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but the web got better because of it. And I think they need to do the same thing for accessibility where they're going to lose some money, but the web will be better for it. I, I think they'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, but that's, that's just, yeah. I'm just going to read a little bit more. Um, this is the first of two articles on the topic of equivalency and how it relates to digital accessibility. It will help us define what an equivalent experience is. Once we have a common understanding established, I'll then discuss how to go about implementing equivalent experiences for common accessibility related issues. And then we circle back to common issues, of course. We always always go to common issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the state of things, the truth of the matter is that even though we live in a multi-device world full of smartphones, augmented reality, voice assistants, and IoT smart sensors, our default is still predominantly visual, large screen, uh, powerful computer and display. People are male, white, wealthy, young, Western, technology literate, and abled. This is reflective of the biases that are inherent in how we design, develop, and grow products. And there we sit, two white men. Yep. Yep. Um, I think I, I felt very uncomfortable uh, promoting this, this talk, um, even though I am very thankful for the opportunity uh, and this article specifically because it is two white men talking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you know, I, I apologize that I would like to give this, this, you know, your project exposure. Um, it's just like now is not, now is not the time. Like this is an existing obligation Yeah. and I'm very, I'm very happy to be doing it, but it's just like, you know, it's, it's killing me because it's like, I wrote this in October <laughs> and it's just like it's not even prophetic because it's just stating the truth of the world and we keep just getting reminded of it over and over and over again we just keep confirming it don't we yeah so i'm sorry this is yeah i, I don't mean to be a bummer it's just like it's, it's the way it is I, I i have nothing to to throw against it or anything i mean uh, it's the truth um yeah. we, we can still act like we're not illiterate that helps mm -hmm. Um, I do have a big screen, but it's really old. Maybe that helps. I don't know. No, but it, it, you know we have these these basic assumptions, and um, some might be stronger. Um, some might play a bigger role when we talk about websites. I mean, when we talk about accessibility, uh, the visual and the large screen, they they play a big role. I mean, I see so many websites. Uh, last uh, last week we talked about alt text, alternative text. That's all about the visual. Mm -hmm. We see all these uh, companies sharing their message on Twitter and you cannot keep one from the other, but still they share their message and uh, they don't have alt text because they share their message in an image. You know, it's all visual. That's what they're used to. And even in these times, they, they 
they keep doing what they're doing. They they share a visual message. Yeah, and I one of my favorite things to do is to dunk on Twitter because uh, they have a lot of performative allyship and they're uniquely equipped to do something like add OCR for images that yeah. have lots of text. There's the emergent platform behavior of people screenshotting parts of articles that they agree and identify with. They're already using um, machine learning to identify the center of an image for their cropping for presenting a thumbnail. So these systems and structures are in place where if you're analyzing images that get uploaded, identify if it's text, throw it through our OCR, make it a seamless user experience so blind people can read the messages you're sharing. Um, you an, know, uh, an actual user need. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I believe Kenny talks about this uh, later where he doesn't participate in Twitter as much because when he's a person and a human being who just wants to enjoy what other people are enjoying, when you're sharing images without alternate descriptions, he mentions there's this problem where he'll be like, hey, can you add a description? And then it derails the conversation and it inevitably spirals out into like trolling and blah, blah, blah. And like, all he wants to do is just be part of this. You know, he wants to be included. And like that- sucks. It sounds like a basic human need and not some strange question, you know? Yeah. And it's it just, it, it also just disincentivizes him to participate in the platform, which is like, you can directly push people out uh, and you can indirectly push people out. Yeah. How inclusive do you want to be? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, not the same, but it made me uh, remind. Uh, it, it reminded me of the experience that I had last week. I mean, we're all uh, quarantined here in the Netherlands. We have the rule that uh, we have to keep about one point five meters distance to each other. Mm -hmm. It's different in every country, so I'll just repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's science behind it. You know that, right? It's all science. Um, yeah. I'm just laughing because we tried to adopt the metric system and it didn't take. <laughs> oh, oh, right. The metric system is the joke here. Sure. Um, and I was out for the first time in a long time. I mean, when you're uh, part of an at-risk group, you don't go out willingly, you know? It's it's a step that you really take. And I was somewhere and, and I met somebody and they passed me and they were really close. Mm -hmm. And I told them, hey, was that 1.5 meters? You were really close. And I got yelled at. You know, that's that's how welcoming our systems can be. And uh, yeah. what I really notice, on at least with these these, uh, these the situation that we are in now, is that a lot of people care more about how they can uh, be caught, like who is going to punish me if I don't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, uh, when we talk about equivalent experiences and what developers should think of, if we think about these rules that we have now and also the protests that are taking place, it seems like people tend to forget that we're talking about people. Mm -hmm. We're talking about other people here. Do you want to include or exclude these people? I mean, somehow somebody in the US or some people, I, I don't think it was one person, but... There, there has been a situation where, where a lot of people are on the street and other people get aggressive with these people. It's people fighting people. Somebody put them there and, and made it happen that, they, that they, they, they hate each other. But in the end, they're all people. How can you, with any respect, hurt another person? You know, and, and I think that's that's when I look at this article as well for developers. Developers should also remember that they're making stuff for people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just hooking up some database to some text field or whatever. In the end, it's an experience for a person and they want to reach some sort of goal. You've got a person on the other side of that screen. And um, yeah, if we can get that through it in any way, let me know how. If I could solve that, I would not yeah. have technology. <laughs> um, I also don't think it's something you solve. I think it's something you work at. Um, but I will say I, I do like to joke with uh, some of my coworkers where it's like, how much better would the would the web be if 
once, you know, for a week out of every month, you had to do your development from a, uh, a small screen, slow five year old yeah. Dell laptop yeah. with antivirus installed on it. I do that every month, but not just a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I have a Dell laptop, laptop right here. I mean, yep. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. No, but yeah, that that makes a difference, you know. Uh, if if there's no empathy to begin with, or it's hard to trigger this empathy, just put them in the position, see how you like it. Then, yeah. But that's only works for some of these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think you know. Sometimes empathy is great, but sometimes you need to also think about the person on the other end being uh, you know consciously and deliberately a bad actor and that's yeah. also like that happens that just yeah that's just the human condition and it sucks and i hate it <laughs> yeah well somebody in the chat now also says that's empathy put yourself in the shoes or situation of your opposite yeah that's that's a lot of uh I think a lot of what we're doing is trying to get some empathy out there. Yeah. I would also suggest sympathy. Um, yeah. Where empathy is troublesome in that you can feel like you have felt the way the other person has felt and then kind of then have the luxury to be able to go back to your regular everyday life. Whereas, you know, a, a sympathetic model is, I think, a little less about that. Um, I, other people have written about this a lot more articulately than I have, but like, I'd take empathy over anything. I don't know yeah. hand. It's just, you know. Give it and we'll or, take or, it. Or, yeah. 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 I'm just going to read a little bit more. I mean, this is, uh, we'll, f we'll find this some more. Um, the previous list may not be the most comfortable, comfortable thing to read. No, it won't. Uh, if you haven't closed the browser tab already, we can't. Uh, take a moment to consider your daily workflows as well who your co-workers are and you'll begin to understand what I'm getting at. At its core, uh, delivering an equivalent experience is ultimately about preserving intent with the intent behind the motivating uh, with the intent being the motivating force behind creating a website or web app and all the f uh, content and features it contains. So intent. And this translates to making the meaning behind every interaction, every component, every photo or illustration, every line of code being understandable by the widest range of people, regardless of their device or ability. Yeah, I think intent really aligns with empathy and sympathy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, a little, go ahead. <laughs> a little, uh, just a little bit on the code front. Um, and this is just a conversation I've had uh, personally, but like, you know, your, your output of your, the output of your program uh, in this context, like a website is an API for other people to consume. Um, and, you know, when I say every line of code, what I'm immediately kind of hopping to is, you know, when you have a browser extension such as Midnight Lizard that, um, you know, one of the people I interviewed mentions using, you know, that selector represents a programmatic hook that you can use for assistive technology. And like when you have something like Twitter, which obfuscates it, it artificially increases the, the barriers that you have towards um, adapting the interface to meet your needs. And like, I don't know if that's something that like is a deliberate decision they're making to protect how they build stuff or if it's they're optimizing it for the you know that the payload do they even know i don't know for performance yeah. reasons yeah, yeah but like you know it's it's just something to really kind of think about is this like there's there's the surface layer and then there's the interactive layer and then there's like the code that makes it all happen and they're all you know you can't separate them no no um I could could go back to my photography study again. Um, one of the people I like to hear about was Marshall McLuhan. I don't know if you... Uh, I don't know what, what part of curriculums he is in. Um, I'm just going to share the name because I love him. Marshall McLuhan. 
and I'm just going to paste it in the chat because I can. Um, one of the, the most famous quotes from this person, and he was a media theorist, I think how we call him. Um, and it says here below on the screen, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. And I, th I I always circle back to this. I love circling back. We, we know that now. Um, basically, he says, sometimes the medium that you choose plays a bigger role than the message that you want to send. And they're, they're connected. They always are. So um, we have a whole society that went, that went digital. But I wonder how many people know what the actual consequences of going digital is. Um, like, like how many consequences are there? Yeah. So Soren, um, who I interviewed. I think he's one they, of the next people, right? Is he not yeah, really yeah. below? They, uh, oh, just, we'll, get, we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. And just to correct the pronoun, it's uh, they. But oh, yeah. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, they mentioned we we had a chat afterwards just because just for the for part. the people I, who haven't read it yeah I'm just gonna uh, Soren is one of the the people that's be uh, that are being quoted here so yeah, uh, further down in the article we we will see their uh, experience yeah and like they had this really good observation um, about you know mug handles where it's exactly what you're talking about like the medium is the message which is they said like when you make tea you wrap you know the the tea bags cord around the mug handle yeah and that's one of those things where the form of the form of the technology that you're using infers how it is operated um and that's like that blew my mind <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you know um i i did write about it i'm not sharing the article right now but like yeah. I compare it to using taking a selfie in voiceover i mean in on a ios device where you can use voiceover and do swiping and tapping and all this like all these controls that are designed specifically for an accessibility persona yeah but they also have voice control um so you can talk to it and that's way easier and more intuitive if you know if you're not mute um you can also like say hey siri take a selfie and you bypass all that activity that you need to do and like that's a mug handle that's a really good mug because yeah. they are they're not prescriptive about how to use the device they just let you do it in the way that you want to do it in a way that makes sense and like that just the technology doesn't get in the way it's just it, a way uh, yeah. they have multiple ways we, we go yeah. back to wakeag basically multiple ways yeah 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 it's the spirit of yeah exactly um so sorry i i just this is like yeah but that's an interesting topic um i i also used to study industrial design it sounds now like i have done many studies which is not the truth <laughs> um but there's a whole field that goes into this that uh, the design of a product can mm -hmm. actually already communicate what the product is meant to be so if you see a door handle that probably communicates, okay, this, this is a size of something I can grab. I can probably rotate it or push it or something. And yeah. the door handle will tell you, yeah, use me to open that door. Unless you're a, unless you're a Norman door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about general doors first. Um, <laughs> but a lot of designs actually communicate what they, what they meant to do. And, um, they, they have secondary use, for example. So mm -hmm. what you're talking about is this mug handle. It has a secondary use. And it might not be designed that way, but if you actually dive in and, and get some sympathy, maybe uh, you can consider that the people will probably use it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but let's go to one of your first voices. I think that's really interesting part of your articles as well. I mean, you spend a lot of time on this. Your editor helped you as well. Sorry. Um, but in the end, it's uh, it's a way to to present voices of different people. And uh, it says here, prior art. Uh, I'm not the first person to discuss this topic and hopefully not the last. Speaker, trainer, and consultant, Nicolas Steenhout, that's actually a sort of a Dutch name, so that's easy for me, uh, is one such advocate. His great post, Accessibility is about people, not standard, is uh, well worth reading. I'll also share this URL in the chat for anybody who likes it. And then it says, if you're the kind of person who is into podcasts, his Alley Rules or Accessibility Rules has a wonderful series called Soundbites. 
It features uh, short discussions with people with disabilities about the barriers they encounter on the web. And these insightful interviews also touch on what this, art uh, what this article discusses. So yeah, you had a, a look at what, what Nick does? Yep. Yeah, uh, I've actually been on his podcast, um, which is was fun. But uh, he talks a lot about um, digital accessibility as well as his experiences as a wheelchair uh, user. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I just happened to find him kind of early on in learning about the accessibility space and like, uh, you know, it's, it's representation, which is like, this isn't new. I, I, this is not my idea. This is things that people have been saying over and over and over again. And the only real difference is this is on a mainstream publication, um, as opposed to on a personal blog. And let's hope some front end developers that that are not interested in accessibility by default, that they get this as well. Right. Yeah. Reach some so, new people. Yeah. So credit is where credit's due. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And then we go to what isn't an equivalent experience. Well, that's the easy part probably. Um, showing examples of what something is not can be a way to help define it. For equivalent experiences, an example would be a web app geared towards, uh, geared towards use by the general public not having a mobile breakpoint. Yeah. How often don't we see those, right? Websites mm -hmm. that are actually targeted at people using mobile devices, but they're mm -hmm. not really meant to be used by mobile devices. It's like, because what is this? This is like a... I'm not even this sure is, what. Yeah, this is um, what uh, my uh, my work uses. It's a uh, it's a um, way to before taxes take money and divert it into uh, things like uh, a flexible spending account for medical costs as well as uh, commuting. So, like, I can pre-buy my train tickets back when I used a train. And All right. Yeah. In in America, you have to pay money to get healthy. So, <laughs> not going into that. Yeah. 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 So this is something that everybody should be using all the time, basically. If you're you're a contractor, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is for contractors, I think. Yeah, it's also offered to a lot of uh, full time employees yeah. who are working in house. Um, it's like a perk, basically, that's offered yeah. by an employer. But. And it you know, oh, sorry. And it doesn't work on mobile. Nope. <laughs> no. I mean, I can question its use on a desktop as well, but on mobile, it just doesn't work. You get a desktop view and everything is way too small. And you probably rotate your screen and start zooming in and hope to mm -hmm. actually be able to touch something or just give up completely. Yeah. What do and you it's, do? It, it's, it's not a hard thing to like, you know, figure out why you'd want to use this in a mobile context as well. It's like, maybe it's the first of the month and I forgot to like get a, get a commuting card. So I'm yep. logging back in to see if I can sneak one in before I get to the train station, or maybe the payment didn't go through and I want to make sure that I don't, you know, get yeah. a ding on my credit report. <laughs> like, and at that point, I hope your ride in public transport is long before you get to the train station, but because this is going to take a while, right? Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then, you know, a step above that is if you have a motor control disability, can you pinch and pull? Yeah. It's a challenge. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Just. Yeah. And then you have to hope that the touch targets actually align with what you think is touchable. And, well, there's a whole list that we could make just from the screenshot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there it says below the image as well, it's not difficult to imagine a situation where I'd want to adjust my work benefits while on the go. Yeah. And also if you consider how many people have a telephone and how many people have a desktop. I mean, yeah. it's for a lot of people, that's the way they access the internet probably. Yeah, I mean, specifically, and like, I want to tie this back into like privilege. Um, you know, if you are in a underserved community, chances are very good your only form of access is going to be a mobile device specifically a cheap mobile device and you know this is how 
this is how like structural inequality is yeah. not created, but, but reinforced. Yeah. And then you're happy that it's your mobile device and not a mobile device. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, with this example, everyone using a device with a small display is forced to pinch, pan, and zoom to get what they need. Here the burden is placed on anyone whose only crime was using a smartphone, which should be a default. Um, most likely whoever conceived of or designed or developed uh, this didn't stop to think about circumstances other than their own. In this sort of, unfortunately, still all too common uh, scenario, I all but guarantee that the web app looks great on the laptop. Or desktops, uh, or desktops uh, of the designers and developers who made it. Yeah, we can still discuss that as well. But let's say that it looks better than on mobile, at least. Um, a designer saying it has enough contrast for me and my old eyes is the same when a dev says works on my machine. There we have that great quote again. Uh, this time by Heather from Twitter, and she also says uh, the thing is though we don't design or develop for ourselves. So are we really okay with saying you don't matter to folks who are not like us? Um, people using a smartphone to access this website are vic victims of circumstance. The extra effort someone needs to do to get it to work indirectly communicates that they weren't a priority and therefore not valued. They are basically excluded, I would say. Um, if you've used the web for any significant portion of time, I'm willing to bet this or a similar experience has happened to you. Yes, many times. Um, and this example is also a hop, skip and jump away from another common yet serious accessibility issue we often don't consider screen zooming. And then we go to another topic. So I won't go to the topic right away. But uh, yeah, here it also says, like like we said before, it uh, works on my machine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all, all the viewpoint that the developer or the designer has. Or the lack of, maybe. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where it's like the fact that computers can turn on reliably and repeatedly <laughs> is kind of miraculous. So, like, yeah, works on my machine is a little tricky <laughs> because, yeah. like, there's just so many situational yeah. factors. It sounds much better if you say, "I just harnessed uh, lightning to to light up my screen." I mean, that's yeah. basically what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah and even my machine i mean what's my machine even between developers there's so much differences you know mm -hmm. it's 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 even even on an in an it department this is a weird way of stating things because one person might be working on a mac another might be working on a windows laptop or um even the differences between firefox and chrome that we mentioned earlier there are so many differences there there is no one thing um yeah. it's, it's really yeah. strange to make assumptions like these yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's like one of the things that we do as or as consultants, and we're not paid to do this, but it's really funny where they're like, "Oh yeah, just get the repo st stood up and running," and you know, we're not cheap, so it's in their best interest to get the repo up and running as soon as possible. Yeah, and a lot of the times we spend the first week just um, debugging, like that works on my machine mentality, where it's like you forget all the steps that you don't document and like all the weird little things that you have in your environment that are atypical. And, like, and, and you even say just debugging, but it's, it's no just, Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's yeah. the hardest thing you can do. Like, um, one of the things I, I also uh, <laughs> want to do in this stream, like I, I like hosting people, you know, like, like having you uh, here to talk to, uh, mm -hmm. makes the thing much less lonely. So that's a good thing. Um, but I'd also like to work on open source projects. Mm -hmm. and and increase the accessibility of open source products. Um, I mean, you would expect if something is open source and they depend on people that they do not pay to work on it, they would be easy to set up. But it's still the same experience. It doesn't matter if you pay for it or not. Uh, it starts with debugging. It starts with just doing things. And uh, it's hell, basically. You have to go through so many gates before you get to the actual product. It's It's amazing. Um, but yeah, it works on my machine, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we need. Uh, screen zooming is when somebody is prevented from being able to zoom their displays and make text larger. Many native mobile apps are guilty of this. That's true. Uh, when you disallow this sort of behavior, you're telling prospective users that unless they have vision similar to you, 
you aren't interested in them being able to use your app. Yeah, you're not. You're, you're actually taking away control from your user. You're saying, mm -hmm. "I know better what you can and cannot do." It's a strange experience to to see this every now and then, especially with websites where you have so much flexibility. I mean, yeah, a kind of a concerning thing back on the SPA front, single page application is um, the more we make the web like an app. Um, a common thing I have to do is have a conversation around just because it looks and functions like an app doesn't mean that being able to adjust the text size is a bad thing. Um, and like, there's this notion that app equals static in terms of layout and presentation where it's like, you know, the dream of the single page app is to have your cake and eat it too, where you can have the web's interoperability, but also a, like a quote, app like experience yeah and so whatever that is it. yeah i mean we're, we're like we're completely through the looking glass at this point where people are making like jamstack sites and spa developers are like how'd you get it to transition pages so fast and it's because they're so bloated that yeah. like they now see the web's default behavior as like instantaneous performance <laughs> it's it's <laughs> actually pretty good yeah yeah <laughs> surprise yeah yeah, we've this come full why, circle. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is why I drink. <laughs> I don't actually. Maybe it's yeah. why I don't drink. <laughs> um for this scenario, a gentle reminder that we will all get older and with aging comes a whole host of vision related concerns. A question you should be asking yourself is if your future self will be capable of using the things your present self is making. Your present self is making. Usually no. Uh, a follow-up question is if you're asking the people you're managing this, what, let me read that again. A follow-up question is if you're asking, uh, if you're also asking the people you're managing. Oh, okay, so you should not just ask yourself, but also wonder, can other people around you, like make the circle small enough that you can actually consider other people? Yeah, it's also, it gets into whose job is it to do accessibility. Yeah. Um, if you're a project manager, you wield more organizational influence. Um, so, you know, that's one of those things, make, make acceptance testing include accessibility criteria. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, if you know it exists, you can do something about it and you, you do have control over developers to push back and say like, this is not sufficient. Um, and that happens all the time for development tasks. So this, you know, in my mind, it's just the same. Yeah. Or should be. Yeah. Um, you've got another quote from Twitter. Uh, I just had my eyes dilated, so I can't read any text that isn't comically large. I don't know how to use a screen reader. Nobody really does, I think. Um, I'll be fine in a few hours, but this has been a fascinating journey into how well third-party iOS apps respect text size accessibility settings. So this is about resizing text uh, in iOS. Even if the disability is a temporary, there's a big difference in platforms. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, this is kind of the thing where, you know, the app model is opt is is top down, where the the web model is bottom up. Where you know, uh, this this person with sufficient motivation or resources could update a web experience to boost the text size to the point where they could read it. And like, this is a prime inclusive design example because she's situationally disabled with eye dilation and it takes her into an extremely low vision context. And that's, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also like the, the developers that say like, like, hey, I had this temporary disability and now I understand my users. And then other people react and say, yeah, if that's what you needed to understand your users, then you were wrong in the first place. But I'm already happy that they at least understand the users. Um, yeah, dilating your eyes is big. I mean, that's going to have a lot of effect. Um, so the next big heading is uh, accessible experiences aren't necessarily equivalent ones. Uh, this might be a little difficult of a concept to grasp at first. Let's use this Ruth Goldberg machine by Joseph Herscher to pass the pepper to his dinner quest to compare. Okay, so there's this small video clip of launching pepper. Yeah, we because, don't have to watch 
watch it. We no. there's a little dis- description below. <laughs> yeah, it's it's what we do every day, right? The launch pepper. Yeah. yeah. Um, to pass the pepper, the machine sends it through an elaborate system of weights, counterweights, ramps, rolling objects, catapults, guillotines, burners, timers, carousels, even carousels. Uh, all constructed from commonly found kitchen items. While this setup will technically ensure the pepper is passed, it's an annoying, overwrought, and time-intensive insen- process. Sounds like a development process. Um, many digital experiences are a lot like a Rube Goldberg, mach- Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah, when it comes to accessibility, since accessibility issues are so prevalent, many forms. Of, assist, uh, of assistive technology provide a large suite of features to allow their users to work around common obstacles. Hey, this kind of grabs back to the, the browser thing that we said. Sometimes the assistive technology is uh, smarter than the person creating it, mm-hmm. creating the, the, the actual content. And yeah, I said I said it, it's, it's comparable to developer experience, like um, people joke around about the size of their node modules folder. Mm-hmm. which for the non-technical people is uh, this big folder where you can just pull in stuff that you can reuse. So if you want to have a dialogue on all your web pages, you could say, hey, npm install dialogue, and you will have this big old folder with lots of stuff that you can use. But most of it isn't even visual. Most of the stuff that you install is not for the end user, but it's actually for developer experience, as they call it. And we use countless of technologies and systems and, and pieces of script all to do something simple, um, some things that we might be better off doing in a static page, like you mentioned, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like I think you mentioned an important thing here, where it's like a lot of assistive technology, like namely screen readers, have their own heuristics, where they're also making decisions on, on what they what they're able to interpret, and like. A lot of that is because, again, we're just so bad at doing this that they need to have a computer go, what were you trying to do here? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I know. So I'm going to tell the person using it that this is supposed to be a list, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a bit like we, we talked a bit earlier about standards mm-hmm. and uh, they're not perfect, but I often tell people at least stick to the standards at least stick to what's what's common what's normal um, because when you follow a standard you can uh, find out what is to be expected and your computer can understand what you were building because if you cannot understand yourself what you were trying to do somewhere then a computer will certainly not understand what you were trying to do and the computer of your user and whatever technology they're using, they will have an even harder time trying to understand what you were trying to do. So that's the good thing with standards and, and following common uh, procedures and common patterns and whatever. Um, at that's least the they're if, predictable, right? Yeah, if you, if you can't be correct, at least be consistent. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we know what you did last page, so we know it again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and unfortunately, discovering obstacles and then figuring out and activating the appropriate combination of features to overcome them can take a disproportionate t- uh, amount of time and effort. Yeah, that sounds like finding out what the you did there. Uh, to say it another way, a simple click on a button or for an abled person may take far more time and effort for a disabled person, depending on how the button has been made. And I think I saw today again a, a captcha in a dialogue uh, that was unreachable by keyboard. And for a normal person, it's like, oh, captcha, I can do this. And then mm-hmm. for an able person, they cannot even reach it, let alone decide what it what it's supposed to do. It's uh, it's not equivalent, yep. right? Yep. Which is, you know, again, I kind of want to keep drumming on this. Which is, what is that captcha allowing access to? You know, is it? Is it verifying that you're a? Actually, let's kind of unpack that for a second. <laughs> when the cap captcha says, you know, verify that you're a person, does that mean if you have the inability to parse a cap- captcha or operate it, it's implying that you're not a person? And then on top of that, like when you're identifying objects in a captcha, you know, what are you building towards? Like for Google, it's for its machine vision algorithms. So, like that starts to get into algorithmic bias territory. And it's also, 
you're being invited to do work for them for free and you don't know what it's going to be used for. Uh, yeah. So like, yeah, we, we discussed this with uh, Yelp a bit. Uh, three weeks ago, we talked about CAPTCHAs and there's there's so many get, get chats with CAPTCHAs or something. <laughs> um, there are so many ethical questions and you just don't know. You're just mm -hmm. feeding this system and you don't know where it goes or, or what they do with it. And that's, that's just besides the whole disability point that you don't even know how to control it or how to operate it. Uh, you don't know, you also don't know where it ends. You know, it's it's just uh, you're feeding some sort of system, and people are even paying it for, uh, sometimes. Yeah, and I guess just kind of to 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 repeat myself a little bit here, where it's like an organization that imply that employs a captcha that turns a person away as a usage of a test to determine if they're a human or a bot is making a judgment call on other defining personhood. Yeah. And so if you are blind and they say you're not a person because you can't use this, that's, that is not good. <laughs> no, it's a system to exclude, uh, to include or exclude people basically. So where do you want to put the bar? That's where they, uh, that's basically the question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are any more questions from the chat, by the way, you're very much welcome to, to ask them. We're just going through the articles and, um, we're not going fast, so <laughs> I think we've got enough room for, for questions. Um, chilling effects. Frustratingly, the extra time and effort a disabled person has to put into operating a technically accessible experience may feed back into their disability conditions. For, examples, uh, for example, the presence of a motor control disability, such as arthritis, uh, may make the overall experience even more taxing. Yeah. So even though you have to do the same thing, it might ask more from you than from another user. Um, and cognitive accessibility concerns are also another important thing to consider. Uh, what may seem easy to understand or intuitive to use for one person may not be for another. This is especially prevalent uh, in situations where there is uh, specialized domain knowledge, education on a new concept, and or a lack of common affordances for how the user interface operates. What is your definition of affordance? Affordances are um, like hints for how something can be used. So, uh, you know, when you have your your door with a push handle on it, um, you go, ah, I pushed this to open the door. Yeah. Um, you know, and like in a UI context, that's one of those things where your buttons look like a button um, or, you know, your link looks like a link. like. Like all the links on this page, yeah. Yes, uh, Smashing Magazine has very good link design, in my opinion, uh, in that they are underlined, which is like the universal, this is a link. Um, uh, somebody also... in the chat says, uh, function implied by design. I think that's very close to it indeed. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, and then like, you know, they have focus states too, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I guess it's it's, Another another problem with digital accessibility uh, is like we want it to be a machine solvable problem. Like we'll we'll throw an automated tester at it, solve all those issues, and cool, great, good job done. But like cognitive accessibility is this huge thing, and like uh, you know, it's you can quantify it. Like it is as much as science, <laughs> yeah. um, it's just, it's something that you are not taught in a computer science education. Far is, from it, no. Yeah, which is, you know, kind of funny too, because it's like, if you've ever tried to set up Webpack, you have experienced cognitive accessibility <laughs> situations. <laughs> you have known some challenges on, <laughs> on the cognitive area, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, it also reminds me of some personal experience, and I think there's some overlap with, with systemic injustice in, in the United States. Um, my experience is that uh, about a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of things uh, surrounding equivalence, especially when it, when it comes to laws, they will say, um, you have the same rights. You know, that's a really easy way to say everybody is the same because you've got the same rights. Mm -hmm. But uh, not everybody has to uh, claim these rights. For some people, they are always there. And you can say, hey, you have these rights, okay. It's all arranged, you know. 
you can make use of these rights. Other people have to go a long way and spend a lot of time and effort to actually make use of rights. Um, and that way, you know, that the, the lawmaking people say, yeah, it's exactly the same. But if the law and, and the system behind it does not help you uh, exercise these rights, then there's no equality, I think. Yeah. And one thing I've been learning actually very recently is how these rights are dispensed and methods of categorization and how specifically um, how structurally uh, mechanisms of power, namely white landholders, shifted the law around. So when these universal rights are given to people, you just change the definition of people. So you can claim to have universality when you basically are just tightening up your systems of control. Yeah, and it's just how you, how you brand it and, and how you present it to the world. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, like tying it back into, you know, like, like the capital crawl, which is like, yeah, you know, we, we've got universal rights except when we don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it's convenient, right? Yeah. 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 yeah um, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I think I see an, an expression on your face that I recognize very much that it is so much to take in. I mean, um, there's so much happening and when you're open to this and um, you go in there with the best intentions, but it's mm -hmm. just so much to take in and it's so hard to, to pick a place where to start to contribute. If you want yeah. to contribute, that's really hard. Even yeah. with all the, the tools you are given, it's it's hard to make a real change because it's so big. Yeah. And I, I will say, like, it's a privilege to be able to learn about this space and not experience it directly. Um, Instead of Webpack. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, but it's also, like, you know, it there's there's like in the accessibility field, it can be very difficult to know where to begin. And like, you know, we, we as an industry of accessibility practitioners have this weird little subcard of like being like, well, you tried, but I'm going to outline everything you did wrong, you know, and just never good enough, never good enough. But at the same time, the stakes are higher. Like, you know, an accessibility error is is different than like code to be optimized. Like, you know, it, it represents access. So like, you know, do you have a bloated CSS selector for your button style? Yeah, you can you can change that up. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Did you use a div and not use ARIA? Cool, you've just deprive somebody of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And and you you also have a, a another website, a project. I don't know how to uh, to frame it properly, but you have the uh, the accessibility project or the ally project. Um and and how do you think that plays a role in in all this? I mean Yeah. Is, is um, that for everybody or is that for the accessibility specialists or so funny you should ask that. Um, we are in the process of redesigning. And uh, I should also state that it is not my project. Um, it's a volunteer-led effort, so there's a team. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe pretty... I could rather say it's a project in which you play a large role, right? Um, only now because I have the, the, the time, but I look forward to... Yeah. a place where I can hand it off to somebody somebody else as it was done to me. Um, and what we're doing right now is we are updating it to have a more inclusive design mindset. And one thing that has become very apparent to me is you need to go wider. Uh, you know, you need to treat this like a holistic concern. And so what we're trying to do is update the mission to include more resources that include design considerations that include perspectives. Um, we're trying to champion 
access people working in the accessibility field. Uh, the the front end development community has a really bad problem with hero worship, notably uh, white men. <laughs> and what I'm hoping to do is kind of steal that a little bit and say like, okay, if you're willing to listen to people that are famous internet personalities, what can we do to make accessibility practitioners personalities? Yeah. Um, with the idea being that like, they'll get Twitter followers, they'll get you know, blog posts read, they'll get accepted to conferences. And if we can do a little bit of helping to promote that. If people you know, want a focal point, you'll give them one. Exactly, yeah. So, um, you know, and we're also looking for volunteers and authors and um, basically all sorts of support. So if that's something and, you're interested in. And a few thousand uh, followers or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one, the one good thing, or one of the good things we have from the project is it's been around for seven years, I think, eight years, which means that it has got some really good SEO. Um, so I'm hoping to capitalize on that. Yeah, yeah. Value to SEO these days, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read a bit more. I, I, I think we're just going to finish one article today, so <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Um, I'm perfectly fine with the way it's going. So, uh, yeah. Anything else? No, okay. Um, cognitive accessibility isn't an abstract concern either. Uh, poor user interface that ignores the circumstances of the end user and dumps too much cognitive load onto them can have very, really, uh, very real, very serious consequences. Uh, and there's an article behind this of uh, McCain. Uh, I can see the URL right now. It says. Navy installed touchscreen steering 10, ton, uh, 10 sailors paid with their lives. I'm just gonna open it just to see what this links to. Ooh, and we get, oh, this is a great user experience. No thanks, I'm all set. Um, the Navy installed a touchscreen steering systems to save money. Yeah, so this is one of those examples where cognitive overload. Yeah. I would like to say that um, this is a scrolling article oh, right. motion, with, with motion. So oh, and sound. Yeah, we've seen enough. Thank you. Um, but I think the short version is they, they installed the system and did not consider the user, right? That is correct. Yeah. And when you are the Navy, that makes a big difference. So here is another... This is the, the story included, I guess. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's just a teaser image. Sorry for all the scrolling. Uh, the military is full of examples of poor interfaces being forced on people who don't have a choice in the matter. It's also one of the orange, the orange, the, the origins of inclusive design thinking. Yeah. So, oh, I also see a message in Twitter or in the in the chat. You would like to hear this one. Ali Project is amazing. So Aww. people are glad about your contributions. Um, but oh, yeah, the. Oh. the Volunteer for it. <laughs> Tackle them right away. Yeah. Um, yeah, the military, it's its even a bigger institution in the US. So I can imagine that their influence has been pretty big. Yeah. The other kind of thing I'd like to point out here is, uh, you know, when you think disability is just for disabled people, like the military will only accept what it perceives as able to yeah. put into its service. And this is cognitive disability directly translating to death. Yeah. They have like the, the, the least diverse um, uh, group of people there, I think. But by design. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I also get the same person saying, oh, that's the plan to, to be volunteering, Eric. So uh, you got one. Yeah, <laughs> the system works. <laughs> Peer pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, compounding effects. Uh, these factors are not mutually exclusive. Proponents of the spoon theory know that inaccessible experiences conspire to sap a person's mental and physical energy, leaving them exhausted and demotivated. I'm, I'm just going to see um, anybody in the chat that's going to react to spoon theory. I, I knew this one, uh, mostly thanks to my wife, actually. I don't use it myself that much, but I, I really like it. Oh, it's Kathleen in the chat, so he knows you. That's what she says. You know her. Um, you should have her on to speak. She was who I was telling you about. Oh, great. 
Yeah. I, I'd love to have her, so that's good. Um, so the spoon theory, I'm just going to uh, say how I, I've experienced it myself or, or my view of it. Uh, the basic idea of, to, of the spoon theory for me is that you start each day with a number of spoons. Uh, no idea about the spoon theory. That's good. That feels like I'm sharing something that people don't know, or at least my version of it. Um, you start each day with an amount of spoons, and, and it really doesn't matter what you call it. If you want to call it forks or knives or whatever, it doesn't matter. You have a limited amount of spoons. You have... Um, spoons and they, they could be uh, batteries or whatever they're, they're, they're talking about your energy and what you can do today so everything you do in a day uh, it costs an amount of spoons and because you have a limited amount of spoons with each thing you do you have to think about am I going to take this from my stack of spoons or am I not going to do it so you kind of have this budget that you have to think about sometimes you're lucky you can take a spoon from the next day so let's say you have 10 spoons today and you can take one from the next day, then you have 11. But next day you're going to have nine spoons. So you basically are constantly budgeting your energy and the things that you do. And um, it's really helped me at least to be conscious of choices that you make. You know, you can make choices um, for energy, especially if you're disabled. That's a really big one. Um, and if you have the privilege, sometimes you can uh, exchange energy for money. So you can just spend money to have to spend less energy, which is a great privilege to have sometimes. Um, but with the spoon theory, it's always uh, a choice you have to make. Like, like some people have seemingly unlimited spoons if every day. They can do whatever they want. Uh, but my experience is that when you're disabled, that you don't have this unlimited amount and that you have to make conscious choices at every point. And even if they are easy choices, it does mean you have to make choices that other people are not making. So you're constantly busy in a way that other people are not busy because they're just able and can do any anything they like. Um, that's the not yeah. so short version. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, and when you, when you think about how the world is, you know, using the social model of disability, it's important to kind of think about like things that take more effort maybe because they were crafted in such a way that access was not considered. Yeah. So a lot of it is artificial. Yeah. Yeah. People can really have an influence on how many spoons something can cost. I mean, uh, the perfect experience costs the same amount of spoons for everybody, at least uh, maybe even less. Yeah. Um, and it's something to keep in mind always. I mean, um, I ordered something online last week. You still see this beautiful background, you know, the attic of accessibility, as I call it. Um, it's because I have this this terrible webcam, and webcams are uh, not a common good these days. I ordered a charger for my, uh, uh, my, my big camera, which is lying around here somewhere. Uh, I had to buy a speci uh, specific charger, and I thought I would have it last week. You know, just ordering something online, that sounds like doesn't cost a lot of spoons. Just just click some things and you're going to have your charger. Um, but then you have to wait through all these websites, which was already a challenge, but I made it somehow. And um, the charger didn't arrive. So you have to chase it. You have to deal with customer service. You have to go on Twitter complaining. I'm very good at complaining these days, even more than before. And you have to spend a lot more spoons than you were planning to, just because you wanted a charger. You know, and, and if the, the, the experience was designed in a different way, like they had a clear uh, time for, for delivery or a better process, uh, easier customer service, whatever, the, the amount of spoons it costs is not in my hands. I know how many spoons I have, but how many I have to spend, that's not in my hands often. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really useful thing. We, we use it a lot in our family. Um, once you know it, you can't forget it. That's, that seems to be the thing. Yeah. If you if you don't mind me asking, kind of like after your surgery, like did you kind of, was it as you were recovering, was it kind of, you know, in terms of expenditure of effort for doing everyday things? Uh, oh, yeah. My, my um, uh, how do I call it the, the best in, in English? Um I don't have as much energy as I had before, you know? Uh, I really like walking, hiking. 
larger distances. Uh, if I uh, walk now, I, l last week I walked for about two miles, three kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it, I had this, this Nordic walking stick and I was exhausted. That was the biggest thing I did that day and it was pretty much all I did that day because I was exhausted. That's, that's like a distance of, of nothing usually. You know, I could tell my wife, I'm just going to walk to the shop and back and it would be less of an effort than that. Um, but in this case, yeah, that was it. I was tired. I was sweating. I walked three kilometers. So yeah, that's, that's something I have to build up. I think it can grow. I think I can get better. Uh, because for the people that don't know, I had brain surgery. I'm currently recovering from that. And uh, a lot of it is just training. Just just trying to get better and, and do the do the same things every day and, and try to get better at them. And mm. uh, something I did notice, which is also maybe aligning with your article again, is that you both have a sort of physical battery, but you also have a mental battery. So you might get exhausted uh, physically, but that mm. doesn't mean you're exhausted mentally or, or the other way around. Uh, and I, I try to use that a lot. And that uh, strangely is... Um, that works in, in multiple ways. So if uh, usually when you talk about energy, you also think about the physical stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I can I can run that far in a day or I can lift that many weights or whatever. Um, but you can also exhaust yourself mentally. And what I'm trying to do is push the physical and the mental uh, boundaries every day. So I'm trying to find the edges of what I can do every day, but on both physical and mental part because you can train them both and they both have this this uh, limit um, but we're moving forward so that's the most important part yeah um, I'm just gonna continue a little bit more you can ask anything by the way that's uh, not an issue at all um, frustrating digital experience can lead to a person abandoning them outright internalizing the system's faults as their own personal failure and that is so annoying I'm just gonna cut in right here because if you make a digital experience and it is not perfect, something is wrong, something is, is challenging the person who's using it, don't assume you get feedback, people will leave you. And the worst part is people will blame themselves. I don't know how many people watch this that have done user tests. The first reaction of any user, if something goes wrong, they'll blame themselves. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's so annoying to see and so draining to see people blame themselves when you know that the designer should have done better. Yeah, we have a family member who has a PhD, is in incredibly, incredibly intelligent, um, and is just not technologically literate. And we kind of push them towards getting a iPad because it simplified the interactions um, that you need to use a computer, which is I think one of the reasons iOS was initially so successful, but like even that, the metaphors are for the interaction modes are just too inconsistent and complicated. And it's just created this mindset where it's, she blames herself and she looks at using technology with dread and with fear and with like anguish. And it is awful. Like, this is something that we've done to somebody as an industry and like how many other people out there like just want to like look at a photo of their of their you know child or like rent a movie you'll never and know we, and we just force them to yeah like walk over hot coals to do it Uh, there's a quote now in the chat from Shelly. You also know, I think, uh, if your game makes me feel stupid, I don't want to continue playing it. And I think you can exchange a game with anything. Uh, if you make me feel stupid, I will stop. You know, that's. there are so many websites with feedback forms. I think they are more often not used than used. Um, I used to have a web shop, a uh, web store. And whenever you get feedback, treat it as a gift doesn't matter if it's positive or negative you got feedback you've got something to improve most people don't even get feedback they cannot improve and they will just have people leaving them and you'll see numbers go down and whatever business things that matter to you um, people will leave you mm -hmm. 
and that's very draining and very hard to see. Um, Shell, we also need to totally nerd out about uh, Last of Us 2 accessibility stuff because I was reading about it and oh my god. <laughs> Should I invite the both of you then? I, I don't have to say anything then. It will be easy, right? <laughs> that's that's her that's hers yeah i know <laughs> she wants to yeah um this abandonment uh may also translate to a person's willingness and ability uh to operate other digital interfaces in other words the more uh, we turn people away the more they'll stop trying to show up yeah it's really a draining experience i think that's really true um then there's a quote from carl groves uh nobody has complained before it's a silly excuse for not caring about accessibility. You're right, they didn't complain, they left. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. It's it's such a recognizable Ooh. experience, yeah. Nobody complains, that's true. Because you never spoke to them also, right? Mm -hmm. um, then there's another heading, don't take my word for it. I'm just gonna try and speed up a little bit and, and see if we can at least finish one page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I um, I do have to go at four o'clock my time, so the 20 minutes. Okay. I, I I would love the opportunity to come back if you'll have me. Yeah, if, if the people uh, will have you, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be a tight race. Um, no, I think <laughs> that should be fine. I think that should be fine. Um, we're just gonna do this article and it's fine. Uh, we can fill days with this. Mm -hmm. uh, don't take my word for it. To make the abstract immediate, I reached out on Twitter to ask people about their experience using assistive technology to browse the web. And I really like that part that you included other people's voices because it's about different kinds of people. Uh, I also took a purposely loose definition of, of assistive technology. All too often we assume the term accessible only means works in a screen reader. Sadly, yes. The truth of the matter is that assistive technology is so much more than that. The way the web is built, its foundational principles and behaviors make it extraordinarily adaptable. It's us, the people who built on and for the web, who break that. By failing to consider these devices and methods of interacting with web content, we implicitly drift further away from equivalency. So, yeah, you, you went on a sort of exploration of what is assistive technology. Were there any surprises for you? Um... A lot more uh, voice control than I thought I'd hear from. And, you know, I want to acknowledge my own filter bubble, which is unfollowing the people that I'm following. And the people of course. that follow me are the ones that follow me. But um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, oh my God, the Amazon product that you talk to that isn't Siri, Alexa, there, Alexa, talk around yeah. the problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, there was a lot of that. The Amazon voice uh, lady, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think for me, it's more like the problem here is there's this tiny, tiny little blip on top of the accessibility space where you understand that like screen readers are actually the minority when you take a holistic view of assistive technology. And so much of our advice is crafted towards making it work in a screen reader that being said that like if it works in a screen reader chances are good it'll work with other devices that consume the accessibility tree but like yeah yeah i've always know. been taught that like uh, a screen reader makes use of the keyboard api mm -hmm. and the keyboard api helps a lot of people so yeah. a screen reader is a good testing tool but uh, we shouldn't get the idea that we're just helping blind people who use screen readers or something like that yeah yeah i think like Specifically, like what's interesting to me is uh, low vision users, and so like there was a lot more high contrast mode than I anticipated, um, which is interesting to me because I have this person, like, I have this bias, I guess, which has just been <laughs> blown out of the water. Of like, it's a very niche tool, but you know, multiple people independently said that they use it, and specifically that they turn it on and off conditionally to use it. So it's you know. <laughs> yeah that's yeah sadly they do yeah it's uh there's a there's a mode in windows called windows high contrast mode and uh i don't think many people are familiar with it but it can have a large effect on how your website is viewed so if you do test in windows high contrast mode that's great um but a lot of people don't and that will give some pretty surprising results i think 
And yeah. um, was there any assistive technology that you did not expect? Like, did you uh, did anybody mention something and you were like, hey, is is that assistive technology? Does that help you? Um, uh, Damien's Midnight Lizard extension, which uh, we get into immediately, but like it, um, it makes sense in hindsight. <laughs> yeah, it's just more more one of those like. A, I didn't know it existed, and B, my first reaction was like, "Isn't this just for like, you know, user style?" And then I was like, "Wait, no, I get it. <laughs> I totally get it." <laughs> yeah, it clicked. Yeah, well, we also mentioned Shelly already, so that's that's easy. Um, but she did a presentation last year at CSUN, and uh, she also talked about assistive technology, and she also mentioned ad blockers, which I have since then completely accepted as being assistive technology. Because yeah. I cannot imagine using the web without an ad blocker. Yeah, I'm um, remembering her talk at um, uh, A11Y Toronto. Yeah, where, you know was, she, she she did it backwards and in heels with all the construction sounds. Yeah, and it was yeah I, yeah, but it worked. Oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, ad block is for me now uh, a synonym to uh, assistive technology. Being able to block all these distractions on websites. It's heavenly, and I have accepted it for a long time as, as really useful, but I never mentioned it as a SIFTA technology. So um, let's see if we can even reach these people now. Um, consistency. For some, assistive technology can mean specialized browser extensions. These micro apps are used to enhance, augment, and customize a browsing experience to better suit someone's needs. And then we uh, come up to Damien, indeed. Uh, Damien is a digital designer. He uses a uh, they use a browser extension called Midnight Lizard to enforce a similar experience across multiple websites. And you said it, uh, Midnight Lizard allows people to use custom CSS, right? Yeah, I believe so. It's it's kind of like a, a theme applier. I'm just going to check real quick yeah. to, for my assumptions. Midnight Lizard, browser extension with custom color schemes for all websites. Okay, so they should apply to all websites, which is the interesting part, mm -hmm. which means they should be applicable to all, web, to all websites. Um, this helps them to focus on the content and to limit uh, two big differences between websites. It's also helping me to avoid too harsh color contrasts that are really uncomfortable. Damien also writes, often websites are really difficult to read for me because either of the lack of consistency in the layout, too narrow lines, or just not enough balance between font size and line height. Related to that, uh, color can create a lot of uh, unhelpful distraction, and I am struggling when too harsh contrast is nearby text. Yeah, I think Damien is very sensitive to uh, um, typography, contrasts, and then he came up with, uh, or they came up with Midnight Lizard. Um, so then you go into, I think, some advice that ties in with, with uh, what Damien has experienced. Yeah. Yeah, so just kind of to talk through it kind of quickly, which is like, I mean, uh, Damien is also a uh, designer, which yep. I think is because, you know, they get it, <laughs> which is it's not about your ego. It's about the experience of using the technology. So like when they're making these modifications, they're designing their own experience to work around somebody else's experience that they designed for them and then yeah. that's that's double the work yeah double the work but um you know the more you can like we we hear all the time these this advice like as like accessibility 101 which is just like slightly bigger font you know line height like you know use use semantic html but like what's powerful to me here is you can tie it right back into a lived experience. Like this stuff does matter. It's not trivial. And then some of this is not programmatically detectable either. Yeah, it touches people. Yeah. So some of the things here you say, how to maintain equivalency is a larger font size and comfortable line height goes a long way towards making content pleasant to read. Yeah, there are a lot of things you can do with typography. Some can, can be done by the user as well, but if it's well designed, they don't need to. Um, it's also nice. Uh, I don't need it on Smashing, but uh, there's also like this reader mode in many browsers. It mm -hmm. often helps me. It, it tries to format the, the text in a, in a readable way. 
but like all accessibility, oh, start scrolling. Uh, like all accessibility tools, uh, the website has to be prepared for this. It has to be yep. able to actually handle this tool. Um, a well-considered color palette with good contrast ratios helps to keep the reader really immersed in your consent, uh, content. Consistent application of color can also help communicate what elements can be interacted with, so long as it is not just the color alone that indicates interactivity. Another bit of WCAG. Uh, ensure the text content is written using text, not presented as an image, allowing it to be read al uh, aloud, restyled and reformatted. So this is where the CSS applies again as well. Use semantic HTML, sectioning elements and structured microdata to allow your content to adapt to specialized reading modes and browser extensions, just like we just did. Mm -hmm. And understand that branding includes how something behaves, responds and reacts in addition to how it looks. Yeah, it's about a user experience. Oh, there we go, page again. Great new keyboard. Um, so yeah, user experience is not just the way it looks. The way it looks is often what we leave to graphical designers and the user experience hopefully uh, touches on a, uh, a lot more subjects than that. Yeah. I'd also like to like point out like uh, reader mode, I consider it assistive technology that is assistive technology that a lot of people don't consider assistive technology. And then within that, like the fun part is it's another example of browsers not being neutral where every browser that has a reading mode experience has said website design is so bad and ads on the web are so bad that we need to provide a tool for users to be able to use web content. Yeah, it's amazing that they saw a need to override basically all styling on a website and present it differently and said that's yeah. better. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. very opinionated. Yeah, indeed. Um, in addition, Damien, oh, I'm just gonna scroll a little bit more. Sorry for the scrolling. Um, in addition, Damien also augments their browsing experience by using ad blocking technology. Hey, like we mentioned, uh, not only for ads, but for uh, to block animations or content that are too distracting for my ADHD. I'm just gonna say one thing, uh, animations on Pinterest. I don't know if you ever use Pinterest, but they have introduced video elements. I always used Pinterest as something for visual browsing. You know, I saw all these images and I scanned through them with my eyes. An animation is not the same thing as a still image. It's it's really, really strange how they thought that would be okay. But yeah. it works on their computer, I guess. Yeah. Um, Scott Winkle has a really good animation canceller uh, browser extension, if you're not familiar. Um, here, I'll throw it in the chat. But if that's something yeah. that bothers you. Yeah, throw it in there, sure. I'll just keep reading um, and see if we can make it to the end. We're close to it. <laughs> Uh, it's not too difficult to imagine why distracting and annoying your users is a bad idea. It shouldn't be. In the case of ads, the industry is unregulated, meaning that rules to prohibit ADHD, migraine and or seizure triggering animations aren't honored. Through this lens, an ad blocker is a form of consumer self-defense. That's pretty well stated. And there we see Shell. Hey, Shell Little. Uh, I'll say it again, telling users their access isn't as important as your bottom line is a bad take. Ads are fine as long as they don't create a barrier by moving. Yes, moving images can be very, very distracting and actually make it unable to focus on text. Um, I'd also like to say that ads are not fine. Um, I'm gonna tie this back into structural inequality. Uh, ads are effectively brokering your information based off of your behaviors to sell back and into an unaccountable system and this directly translates into things like how you're evaluated for your credit reports. Yeah. Uh, what, where you can look for a home. Um, you know, Facebook is a big example of a system that like was doing digital redlining. And part of that is like factoring in algorithmic perception of people who browse the web and engage with advertisements. And part of that is like how these inherent biases affect uh, you know, minoritized groups, specifically the black community. Yeah, so it's it's basically like an ethical black box that you just put on your website. Yeah. Yeah, that's... It, it, it's funny that when you try to translate it to other technologies, like we, we uh, had somebody mention books before, you can't even translate it. I mean, it's impossible to imagine that everybody that opens your book 
shares their information the moment they open it. There's like, yeah. yeah. Let's not dive into it too much, but that's just unimaginable. I'm um, just going to say libraries are really freaking cool. <laughs> libraries are great. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a news article this week in the Netherlands that said uh, somebody forgot to bring back a book for like 35 years or something. Um, and they came back and they had to pay five euros and it was done. So yeah, libraries are about books and reading. And uh, that's, oh, somebody in the chat says 39 years even. 39 years not bringing back their book. Five euros. I think that's a reasonable price. Yeah, yeah, they came out on top there. <laughs> yeah, they, they like he didn't even read the book. That was the good part. It was like a reading list book, you know. He says it's not a book people actually read. It's yeah, well, five euros. Um, it was the maximum fine. Yeah, yeah, that was the good part. They had a maximum fine of five euros. Otherwise, it would have been over fifteen hundred euros if they actually counted the days and everything. But it's, that's a more expensive book to not read. Um, Kenny Hit also chimes in about ads. Uh, regardless of the platform that annoys me most are uh, websites with ads that essentially cause the site to constantly auto-update. Yeah, this prevents me as a screen reader user from reading the content of those websites. Um, yeah, I talked to this, uh, talked about this uh, to somebody yesterday. They also had a refreshing website. When you talk about keyboard focus, um, there's basically one rule that says don't touch it. Yeah. Uh, the keyboard focus is, is a part of the user experience. It's, it's what the user can control. Uh, don't touch it. Let the user take care of keyboard focus. Like there, there are really few exceptions, like in a dialogue, you might want to do something, but in general, just don't touch somebody's focus. It's their focus. It's not, it, it's like taking over somebody's mouse and telling them what to <laughs> click. You don't do that. So please don't leave Kenny alone. I guess that's uh, that's what I want to say. Um, again, a lack of regulation means the user uh, must take measures into their own hands to keep the experience equivalent. Uh, how to maintain equivalency? Avoid scripts that refresh the page automatically. Yes, they do exist. Uh, avoid flashing and strobing animation, especially, uh, especially animations that are known seizure triggers. Provide methods to pause any and all animation. Yes, please. Uh, use the prefers reduced motion media query to disable animation if requested. That's a really nice one. Uh, not many people are aware. I don't. I also don't know how many people actually use this media query. Um, besides from people who are already aware of accessibility. Um, but you can actually set it, uh, for example, in uh, Mac OS, you can say, hey, I don't want any animations. And it will honor websites that honor it as well. So it's a whole honor system. Uh, don't use scripts that try to detect ad blocking. If a modal is used to inform someone about a newsletter sign up, hey, we just saw one. Cookie policy or that they're using an ad blocker. Ensure that the modal traps focus and can be dismissed using a keyboard. Yeah, good modals. No such thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have them everywhere. So you're basically telling everybody to use something that doesn't exist. I guess that's uh, that's reasonable, right? Um, I'm I'm just gonna scroll a bit further. In, in just just uh, cut through. Oh, this is the last paragraph. Oh, we have such great we got, timing. Yeah, we we're almost. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're almost at the end of the time um, and the article. Yeah, I can I can give you another ten minutes, but um, I think no, but. That, I, I'm, yeah. You might hear it that I'm I'm tripping over my words more and more as well. So I think we've yeah. uh, we've done enough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> done enough damage, yeah. Yeah, it's it's perfectly fine. It's really funny when you when you look at the, at at, um, at all these guides about streaming. They say, yeah, you have to uh, stream seven times a week, and you have to be on there constantly. And and I'm reading these things and think like, this does nope. not apply to me. No, I stream no. once a week right now, and that's more than enough. Maybe I'll stream tomorrow, but. That's a, that's a different story. Uh, a lack of an equivalent experience translates directly to lost opportunity. Many individuals I spoke with mentioned that they'd abandon a digital experience that was inaccessible more often than not, as we mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Brian Moore mentions there are websites where I like their products a lot, but won't buy them because the site itself is such a struggle and attempts to reach out. Uh, 
and attempts to reach out have met with either silence or resistance to taking any actions. Yeah, when we talk about spoons, uh, sometimes the, the, the process of ordering should be included in the price. So you might think, hey, that product, I know what I want. It's one spoon or whatever. Uh, but then you have to consider, yeah, ordering is going to take some spoons as well. And maybe it will end up damaged or, well, it's, it's all part of the equation. And uh, Brian cites the Fluence website as the most recent example. The bugs present in its shopping user flows prevent him from buying high-end consumer audio equipment, usually not even cheap products. Fluence entire web presence exists to sell products while updating a website or web app to be accessible can be an effort intensive process. It would definitely be in Fluence's best interest to make sure its checkout user flow is as robust as it could be. Yeah, it's it costs money, right? That money speaks. Um, I'm gonna see Wake business case is the yeah the business case for digital accessibility. I'm just gonna share this one. If you struggle with your organization where you work, you tell them who do you want to exclude, and they don't have an answer, and they start talking about money. Uh, you can always point to the business case. Yeah, the other thing that just like kills me here is you know he's trying to buy nice speakers and like you can make the appeals to morality of like well you know to operate civic services or to apply for a job or like you know yeah. those kinds of things that are you should know, be equal yeah this this is this is something that somebody is trying to do for pleasure so like this is robbing him of joy and that's equally as important yeah like so if you're building a shop like this you cannot just ask who are we going to exclude you can also say hey whose joy do you want to rob basically yeah and it's it's sixteen hundred dollars also like yeah. that's that's six sixteen hundred dollars they didn't make and yeah. he's only one person that's willing to tell me about it i don't know how many times somebody hit this and did not spend that i think many times and yeah. uh yeah that's the spoons basically i mean in theory people always say yeah but i, I i'd like to help you know i can help you out um the neighbor maybe wants to order it for you but that's not independence and that's not free and that's not empowering in any way that's not an option that's not an alternative so the alternative is going to another website and say hey maybe i like these speakers more not for the speakers but for the website uh, maybe not for the listening experience but for the user experience of ordering them yeah that's the way it's going to be um it's yeah. also like there, it's it's accessibility as a differentiator which is you know if you are selling quality a quality can be measured by how accessible you are and like if there's two high-end speaker companies that sell you know sixteen hundred dollar speakers they're not going to be a lot of them no yeah but like yeah you know, it is it is a metric that will be evaluated um, because it helps to communicate an overall sense of you know this is a company that has their shit together and knows how to make a speaker because they know how to make a website. Like, yeah. Yeah. And they're doing a lot of things, right? I mean, I, I see they have uh, um, a lot of options that you can pick from. And, and I see that they just, just from what I see here, this screenshot of their website, I see that they consider the user flow, you know, there are a lot of things that you can add. For example, right near the price, they state that they have free shipping and free returns. Why is that? They get sales that way. You know, they, they think about their flow. This is not a standard template. They did things to improve this, but not for Brian. So, yeah, yep. um, it's a bit of a sad note, but I think I want to end it here. I think I'm going to uh, end the stream for now. If you want to come back, I would very much appreciate it. But first, let's ask, are there any questions from the chat maybe at this point? So they don't have to wait. I think that would be nice. They have mostly been listening, I hope, close to breathlessly, but I'm not seeing any any um, questions pop up right now. Just a no, no. <laughs> so that's pretty clear. Um, for those of you who did join, thank you very much for uh, spending your time this way. I, it means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot as well. So I hope if you would like to come back, 
we can do this again sometime. And uh, the invitation goes both to you and other people listening or seeing this. If if you think anybody would be great to have uh, on the stream, if there's somebody that I can uh, go through an article as well or a presentation or whatever, is there anything uh, that we can look at together? I'd love to do it. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for now. I'm just going to stop the stream. Uh, thank you all for, for listening. Thanks for your questions. And uh, I hope you pick something up from Eric. Eric, good to see. Good night. Okay.